Good morning. It's a great drive here this morning, except that sun gets right in your eyes. But uh, we're looking for a man to teach the two older boys next week, first session. If you feel like you could do it, pardon me? Just one time. Nolan and Riley. Um, Dawn is still in the hospital, recovering from open heart surgery. They're going to keep her for another week, and then she's going to go to the hotel that's Daryl and Gloria will be there from two to four days to see if she can, you know, live outside of the hospital, and then they'll, then they'll bring her home if, if everything's okay. Yeah. Is, that, is that right? Yeah. yeah. And her, her heart muscle is squeezing very good, but that it's the relaxation that's not doing as good? You know, yeah, yeah, I understand that. And then wishing everybody a happy thank, thankful Thanksgiving. Um, we're very fortunate to have the assembly we do. I mean, everybody's so nice. It's just, you know, I, I can't believe it some of the time. It's just great. And we do take the tables down today. So set out with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this time in your word. Thank you for the minute verses in the word you say that illuminates our soul and our inside to understand what you've done with the world. Amen. Now, I like what Rick was preaching. Um, there are two things you'll learn when you study the Bible dispensationally, when you rightly divide the word of truth. Number one, you understand the Bible better than you ever did. You understand God's plan and the unbelievable gift he's offered mankind for 2,000 years. And once saved, always saved, right? It's unbelievable. The second thing you should understand or that happens, you learn how little you really do know, <laughs> which should keep you humble, okay? People, I mean... We can say that. I don't feel any insecurity about that, but I do know little. The more you learn about this, the bigger it gets and the deeper it gets, and it's just, there's a, there's, it's endless. So, you know, you learn about the Bible, then you learn how to be humble because you know how little you, you realize how little you know. Um, still in Second Thessalonians, and when I get to the end of the message, I don't want you to close up right away because I got three more verses I want to want to finish to show you right at the end of the message. Okay, I want you to read them though. Um, last week, after discussing Israel's three major tithes, the government tithe, the festival slash worship tithe, and the welfare tithe, we ended up on the following information: these tithes have nothing to do with the church, the body of Christ. This is for the functioning of the nation is Israel. First tithe in the Leviticus is for the Levites. Are you a Levite? Are we Levites? No. We're not spiritual Israel either. We are not part of the Levitical priesthood. Neither are we spiritual Israel. This is not understood by many Christians today because their leaders do not study the Bible dispensationally. I know I'm beating a horse all the time, but I, you have to get the word out there. And people, you know, they get angry when you, you, you just hint at the word dispensational and they turn you off or kick you out or whatever. Many teach that we also have to give tithes to the church today. How many of people have you talked to in your lifetime that gave over their W-2 at New Forum and they, they tithe off the gross, not the, not the net? And, and it's, you know, they, you know... All of our taxes, I mean, they give tithe. I'm sorry. Many t teach that we are also have to give tithes to the church today, but all of our taxes go to the government, contrary to Israel's taxes. Part of their taxes went to support the Levitical priesthood because they didn't get a portion of land. The tribe God selected to work through with his laws and commandments. Why? Because they were under the dispensation of law. From Genesis 12 on, God is working exclusively with the nation of Israel. It's 
exclusively. Today we are in the dispensation of grace, and we are not under the law. Rick quoted the verse, Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not have dominion over ye, for you are under the law, not under grace. I mean, under, let me read it again. For you are not under the law, but under grace. <laughs> you know, I get confused up here sometimes, and that's, that's age, you know. Still today, so many Christian pastors ignorantly quote Malachi 3.10 to guilt you to give money. This was written for Israel, time past and ages to come, seen and practiced before and after Paul. Just like in Paul's time, most turned a blind eye to Pauline truth. Through seen in practice before and I'm sorry. Though Peter, James, and John supported it. Let me read that again. Just like in Paul's time, most turned a blind eye to Pauline time, truth. Though Peter, Cephas, James, and John supported it. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, 37 to 40, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Is that verse hard to understand? Why is it like an enemy to people who don't write the divine? But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues, let all things be done decently and in order. Now, we know those tongue things and things like that, that's, they stopped after Acts 28. How do I know that? Well, in one of the chapters there, there's six rules for speaking in tongues. First rule, it was supposed to go to Israel. People, they didn't understand. Not one church anywhere in the world follows these six rules. No women, it's got to be in order. The Holy Ghost, has, somebody has to be there to interpret the, the, the tongues, which is of an, uh, of an own language. They don't do that. They just go whooping and wild and, you know, just jumping up and down and just go crazy. It, salvation is not an emotional decision. It's a logical decision. Now, our kitchen is about 99% done. Debbie and I are still married. <laughs> and there was a great group of guys that, that did the work. Um, one guy is learning English. He's, he's, he, you know, there were, uh, three of them were Christian. One of the guys from Guatemala, he rightly divides. He's really on fire for it. And we talked to the guy, Luis, who was, uh, who, who was a, who saved. And we gave him some information. We have information, things that different, all, it's written in Spanish now. We gave them, him, a whole bunch, a pile of stuff. And I told him, I think you could understand that you're going to understand your Bible better than any time else, any time in the past, once you read this book or once you read this or that. This is what right division does. It illuminates, it illuminates you, it takes away the ignorance and you can stand on firm ground, not pointing to yourself, but pointing to the Word of God, because anything good we do comes from the Word of God that He teaches us, and we can't claim anything. That's why it should keep you humble. Now, let's just read some of these verses that to show you that, that the circumcision apostles agreed with Paul. In Galatians 2, verses 7 through 9, Let me start at verse 6. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For those who seem to be somewhat, they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. In other words, Paul added to them. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was under Peter, now, there's two Gospels, uncircumcision and circumcision. For he that wrought effectually in Peter, the 
in the Lord, to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Paul is the apostle for the Gentiles, Romans eleven thirteen, And when James, Cephas, and John, that's James, Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, underline that word seemed. They were pillars in the past, but they're not pillars anymore. Perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Heathen include anybody, includes anybody that's unsaved. Okay? Now go to Second Peter. No, second, let me just read you. Still stay in Second Galatians, Galatians 1 and 2. Now let me read you this passage because Peter or Paul had to rebuke Peter for being two-faced. I might as well. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So in other words, he wasn't keeping true to himself, true to what happened. Even though he acknowledged Paul, he was afraid they were going to do something to him if he was seen with Gentiles. And Paul, that was, Paul had to publicly rebuke him. Now, do you think that got him a little upset? What do you think? Well, go to Second Peter chapter 3. I don't think he held on, to, held on very long. He got too upset. In Second Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, now again, all I'm doing is pointing you to Pauline truth, to the dispensation of grace, to the free gift God has offered mankind for the last 2,000 years, the best news anybody could ever could ever receive, and they, they, they turn, turn against that. The very best news. Everybody can get to heaven. How do I know that? Well, you have to acknowledge that you're a sinner and that Christ died for your sins. You believe in the privacy of your heart. Okay? 2 Peter 3.15, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to, understood, hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. When people, if people don't get saved, they don't understand it's once saved, always saved. They'll be quoting verses on their way to hell. Have no effect. Okay? They're resting through, you know, and it's so important. In the dispensation of grace, when the Apostle Paul talks about giving, he says the following. Every man, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. Now, the expression, or of necessity, automatically proves Israel is not involved. They had three ties that were mandatory. They had to give that. Let me show you why. In time past, tithing for Israel was absolutely mandatory. Take note. Tithes were not gifts directly to God. Two, there were taxes for the funding of the government, the, wel the worship and the welfare system, welfare system. They were necessary. And if a Jew did not give, their scripture says, they have robbed God. How do I know that? Look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet have ye robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. This is the only time in the Bible where it says somebody robbed God. And he's speaking to Israel. Now, there are pastors out there that will put these verses on Christians to make them feel guilty. Have you ever been to any of those churches? Churches? Yeah. Most have. It was a guilt trip. You're not going to get nothing out of me if you try to guilt me into something. I'll tell you that right now. That's not the way you deal with it. It has a... 
The Bi Bible tithing is for Israel, and one should not quote Ma Malachi 3 to make you feel guilty. It has a very special relationship to the nation of Israel. That's number one. Number two, it has a special relationship with the nation of Israel in view of Israel's last days, Hebrews through Revelation. You get a lot of information over here before Paul, then that time passed, this is but now, and this is the ages to come. Hebrews to Revelation. Who was Hebrews written to? No good. What book explains the cross to us today? Romans. What book explains the cross to the Hebrews? Hard, hard, huh? Pretty hard. Right? That's hard to understand. Oh, boy. And Paul didn't write Hebrews. I'm going to show you that at the end of, end of here, end of the message here. <clears throat> Turn back to Nehemiah chapter 1. Well, I'll just read it here. To start understanding the, this 10% issue that moves out from the Levitical worship and welfare tithing to what the 10% is all about, it is important to understand and notice that this is one of those verses that can be easily overlooked. Nehemiah 11 verse 1. And the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem the rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in other cities. Now God tells Israel to tithe people, one in ten. Israel, you just don't tithe, you don't just tithe the produce, the production, the farming, the agricultural income. But God also ties people, and he identifies a tenth of the people. Israel is identified as a seed, and that seed, those people are tithed. So let's go through the next section here. In this section, we're going to see Abram before he was Abraham. Genesis 13, 14 to 16 on your, on your sheet here. Genesis 13, 14 to 16. And the Lord said unto Abraham, After that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou sowest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if, that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then thy seed also be numbered. Then shall thy seed also be numbered. God has a seed in the nation of Israel. This nation is going to be his seed in the earth. The seed of the woman becomes the seed of Abraham, the seed of man. Now, he's talking to Abraham, Genesis 17, 6 through 8. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed, he's telling this to Abraham, after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed. Oh, I forgot to underline that one. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, is that easy to comprehend? Is it hard to, you know, do you understand what's going on? God's taking the nation of Israel. He's telling Abraham, I'm going to give... This land to the people, your, your, your seed, I'm going to give this land to them. Now, God is developing a seed line in Abraham, which extends to Isaac. Genesis 22, 15 to 18. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son. Where are we at here? God told Abraham to sacrifice his son, right? 
And Abraham, Abraham was willing to do it. And God saw the intent of his heart, he, you know. For because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And, thy, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Is Israel blessing all the nations on the earth? No. Do you think we'd understand it if it was happening? I do. So God is developing a seed line in Israel, which now will extend to Jacob. Genesis 28. I forgot to read you a couple of things here. Hold on a second. I say, I put a note here, and living, coming here. I can't tell you how many people I've personally talked to to who've been put under the bondage of this, you owe this money, the tithe system. It's sad and it's scary. I lived under bondage, my childhood. I, I know legalism. It was a pressure cooker. I did not like it. That's one of the biggest reasons that got me to this message. Living in it, and understanding it are two different things. It took the Bible for me to completely understand what went on in my life. That opened it all up. That's why I've been at, after this for over 30 years. That mean I, our life went like this. Unsaved, saved. And, it, you know, it's just, it's, you know, I realize that once saved, always saved. It's a doctrinal truth. Truth. It's freely given. The God of all comfort tells us to comfort others the way God comforted us. How? Through his written word. And he puts a special he and he puts special verses in the Bible that hammers in the truth of the message of grace. One that allows the truth to sink deeper in your inner man and makes you realize how little you really know. You can understand it, but this is the guy that did it, and he wrote about it, and he wants us, everybody to have it, the free gift. It was a monumental change in our life because of the, the change of thinking and the fact that I had lived in a pressure cooker and this and that. It, it, it was crazy. And then 41 years later, we got, I got saved. I said, okay, now I understand <laughs> all of sin and come short of the glory of God. You know, you don't have to have, feel this way, that way. You carry it with you the rest of your life. But the point is, this is what made the difference. And taking this in here and responding from that and not taking any credit for it. Because there's too many people, pastors out there, that, that think they're really something and they really aren't. aren't. Now, we're going to read about Jacob and the seed. J Genesis 28, 13 to 14. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land wherein, whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and, on, and to the south. And in thee... And in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Any trouble understanding that? There's Abram, Abraham. In Genesis 12, he starts forming the nation of Israel. The seed, I'm going to give this land to the seed, to you, to the seed. Then it goes to Isaac and it goes to Jacob. Now, so the seed line goes to Abram, then Abraham, Isaac, then Jacob. No. Genesis 14, then it goes to the entire nation. Genesis 48, I'm sorry, on your, on your outline. Genesis 48, 1 to 4. And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick, and he took him his two sons. He took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel, that's Jacob, strengthened himself, and sat upon the bed, 
And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said unto, unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people, and I will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. Now, is there any truth in the Palestinians own any of that land scripturally? No. Israel's been willing to give things up, park land, just to keep peace, but it'll never happen according to Genesis you know, 16, 12. They have an, an, an eternal hatred. Now Jacob sees, sees the seed going out to all of his descendants, to the 12 tribes. And as you go down through there and into the next chapter, you see a seed that goes through the nation of Israel. Now let me read this next psalm here. This is a great psalm about the crucifixion of Christ. And the latter part is about his resurrection in this kingdom. Psalm 22, verses 28 to 31. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. And they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the, to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. So here is a generation that has to be born, a future generation that is going to be a seed, and they are going to be a generation. Also, a spiritual regeneration will be produced in a remnant of Israel who are going to be the seed. Now, I've got a lot of verses I'm going to say. But let me just give you the, I put down four verses. I, re, I read them, I mean, I wrote them out in my back. And I think, what are the verses that stand out the most that explain law from grace? So show, show there's, a, there's a, something happened in the timeline. He was dealing with Israel and then exclusively, and then all of a sudden, it's Paul you know, and changed. So in Acts 13, 39, it says, And by him that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Hard to understand? Acts 14, 27, They rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. If the door of faith was open here, was it open before that time or was it closed? It was closed. When did the door get open? Now, you're in the book of Acts. There's the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. Things are changing, okay? Israel's not going to get a land right away. Something's going to happen. Paul came in, and, and what came in with Paul is the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation and the mystery. And it's about the first thing I started talking about, the greatest gift God gave mankind, and most people don't want to don't care about it. Galatians 6.16 and as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the true Israel of God. What's the true Israel of God? Romans 16, 7, Paul says, Salute Andronica, Andronicus, Junia, my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners, who were of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. What does Paul say in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16? He says, he is the pattern, follow him. Unto me first. Were, was Peter before Paul? Yeah. So there were saved people, the little flock that believed Christ, in time past, that believed Christ. And that, that verse just hits it on the head. So, the regenerated seed. And I want you to go to... I'm going to flip it around. Go to um, Matthew chapter 19. I'm going to give you a lot, of, a lot of verses here. Matthew chapter 19. Let me show you about the, the seed. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. And they get John chapter 1. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. It says, 27, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we are forsaken all and follow thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now go to John chapter 1. Verse 11 to 13. It says, He came unto his own, but his own received him not. Who are his own? Spiritual Israel or fleshly Israel? Fleshly, right? But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. Turn to John chapter 3. All to Israel. Let me read you verses 5 to 7. John 3. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except the man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, no, no, notice, ye and thee, thee, singular, ye, plural, must be born again. That's a verse you want to show people, because thee is all, anything with a T in it is singular, and ye and you in the Bible, in the King James Bible, are, is plural. Thee must be born again, okay? First Peter chapter 1. Trying to imprint these verses on your mind. First Peter chapter one, verse twenty-three. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Look at how important the word of God is. They had the word just like us. Now let's go back to Isaiah 66. We'll go back to the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 66. And let me read you verses 7 through 9. Isaiah 66. And then get Ezekiel 36. Israel, Isaiah 66, 7 through 9. But before she travailed, she brought forth, before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall they cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith God? And it just goes on and on. The nation's going to be born once. In Ezekiel 36, look at verses 24 to 27. They're going to have the tribulation. They're going to be weeded out in this time period. Okay? starting from Revelation 6. But in Ezekiel 36, 24 to 27, it says, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries, and I will bring you into your own land. 
Now that's pretty selective, right? Who's he taking out of all countries? Israel. He's going to bring them to the land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. People always say, what should we do? Throw water, dunk them, or, you know, you know. And, and churches, have these, churches have these tubs that they fill water and they come up in their underwear and get drenched in and then everybody claps, you know. It's just, you know, I don't know. You don't, you don't need that. It's just for show. Let's have a wet t-shirt contest, I guess, you know. But geez. <laughs> then I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. That hasn't happened yet. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take out the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of, I'm sorry, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk on my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. He's going to make them do this, but they need a change. They need to get reborn again. They need that spirit of the new covenant. We are not under a covenant, okay? Most Christians think we're under this covenant, and they try to act like this, like they can't do any wrong, and they fail. Go to Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews chapter 8. Jeremiah 31 Hebrews chapter 8. Now I want to show you where the New Testament is written in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is written in the New Testament. Jeremiah 31. Thirty-one to thirty-four. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and with. Pardon me. Thirty-one. Didn't I say that? Okay. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them, to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And we already have our sin taken care of. Israel as a nation has to go through that again. Today in the dispensation of grace, there's no distinction between, between Jew and Gentile, male, female, bond or free. Only people who can read good and I can't. He, Hebrews chapter 8. Let me start at verse 7. I'm going to go all the way to the end. Hebrews chapter 8. Now, Jeremiah 31 fits Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8 fits Jeremiah 31. For, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. The dispensation of the law. But Moses said to them, if you, if you do all these things, you, they said, we'll do it all. Well, they didn't. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. That's the northern and southern. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Didn't I just read that in Jeremiah 31? And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. God doesn't care how much of a bank account you have. 
For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And that he saith, a new covenant he hath made with the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Now you get Christians, if you go to 2 Corinthians 3, that think we are under the new covenant. Because of this, I'm going to show you in 2 Corinthians 3. It says, verse 6, who also hath made us an made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now the word testament is the same word as covenant. So what do you do with this verse? A covenant is a contract. A testament, your last will and testament. This is what I hope to happen. Right? This is what I want to happen to Israel once we're raptured up out of here. He's, been, he's entrusted that knowledge to us so that when we're raptured up and the unsaved Jews, they realize that the rapture happened, they'll go to Hebrews and start reading. They'll go back and read Daniel. They'll read Revelation. They'll know what's going They'll know the 220 days, the, the, it's going to be, the temple's going to be built, and they'll know precisely where they're at. And some of them will have to die for their faith. If they don't get the mark, either, you know, they'll just die. So... But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stone, was glorious, now well, that's the Ten Commandments. All right? Death, ministration, the law. Can't, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit rather be glorious? The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. We have the information that Israel needs for this time period. And for 2,000 years, God has been holding back that wrath, that, that prophesied wrath, and ushered in 13 epistles which finished our Bible, according to Paul. No, we don't worship Paul. Where is that now? I think I read this. Here is a generation that has to be born, a future generation that is going to be a seed. They're going to be a generation. Also, a spiritual re regeneration will be produced in a remnant of Israel who are going to be the true seed. Okay? I read you that in Ezekiel 36, Jeremiah 31, Hebrews chapter 8, second, verse Peter, you know, they're going to be born again. Malachi 2, 14 and 15. Yet ye say, wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and thy wife, and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion, and the wife of thy covenant. And did he not make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed, not just a seed, but a godly seed, Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. When I met Debbie, I wanted to marry. That's a covenant we made. It's a contract, you know? And we did. And we're still married, even after the kitchen remodeling. <laughs> Although I'm sure she'll find something else. You got to keep your humor. We see that this is not just to be the physical seed of Abraham, but it has to be the godly seed of Abraham. I'm giving you the verses. This is where that new birth in that born again nation comes in. So Israel is described as a seed because God is going to produce some fruit in the earth 
a godly seed, a godly generation, a righteous generation to serve him. And we just read some of the verses there. Now, get a little further along. In Exodus 16, God began to feed the nation of Israel with manna. One of the things they were told to do with manna, Exodus 16, 31 to 35, and the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And Moses said, this is the thing which the, which the Lord commandeth, fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations. I'll get to the omer in a while. So fill an omer, it's a, it's a dry measure for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. And the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came unto the borders of the land of Canaan. That's the promised land. Now, if you recall Joshua chapter 5, it's a short chapter. When they came to the, to the borders of Canaan, and the children of Israel also encamped at Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Now Gilgal was the site of this, okay? It's the first site of an Israelite camp west of the Jordan, east of Jericho. Let me read you something about here. They crossed the Jordan River, they encamped in the Promised Land. They took stones from the Jordan and set them up at Gilgal as a memorial. Remember the 12 stones they told, told them to do? Okay. That's a memorial to, to God's deliverance. The first Passover in Canaan was held at Gilgal. In later years, Gilgal was the site of King Saul. King Saul's coronation, as well as his rejection by God as king, after Absalom's death as David's son, the Judeans gathered at Gilgal to welcome David back as their king. But during the latter days of later kings, Gilgal became a center for idolatry. Now, when I finish this verse, don't finish, don't close up. No. What did they put in the ark? There are two tables of the Ten Commandments, testimony. There's Aaron's rod that budded, depicting eternal life. Then there's a little pot of manna. The pot of manna represent, represented God's provisions in preserving the nation of Israel. Now notice the tiny last verse in Exodus 16, verse 36. Now an omer is the tenth part of an ephah. This is another verse that could be easily overlooked. An ephah is about a bushel. An omer is one-tenth of, of an ephah. Okay? He just tied ten people from Jerusalem. So, an omer, it's weird. You see the tithe, the tenth part, had a connection with God preserving the holy seed through the wilderness and into the promised land. Now, three more places to go. Go to 2 Thessalonians. How does all this relate to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, 
seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to them who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now here's the two verses. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the power of the glory of his power. Now, two more verses. Go to Hebrews chapter 12 and Deuteronomy chapter 4. So what are we reading in that passage? There's some punishment coming, isn't there? Some judgment. Hebrews chapter 12. And Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 4. No. The last verse, Hebrews chapter 12. Now, you've got to realize, Paul never said, mentioned anything like this. It says, for our God is a consuming fire. What did Paul, how did he describe this dispensation of grace? Grace, peace, mercy, right? Not that God's a consuming fire. So you just read about that fire in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, didn't you? So there's reasons why we study the Old Testament. When you learn about how to write the divide, you compare how it was under the law and how it is under grace as far as God is concerned in sins. We compare all the time. It used to be this way, now it's this way. And still, a lot of people don't understand. Now it's this way, but it is. Deuteronomy chapter 4. What did Hebrews 12, 29 say? Our God is a consuming fire. Deuteronomy 4. And look at verse 24. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Now you see the connection there? Deuteronomy is the second given of the law. Hebrews calls him, our God is a consuming fire. The nation has to tithe, three, three tithes that are necessary. One tenth, and God tithes people, you see, in, in Exodus. And it all relates to, to this end time punishment that's going to come to the nation of Israel. We are allowed to learn that part and to compare it with the dispensation that we are now in. God is not a fire to us anymore. He's there to give you grace and peace and justification and salvation and everything that's going to get you to heaven. Dear Lord, thank you once again for this time in your word. And thank you for clarifying things in my life and hopefully in people's other lives, other people's lives. The word is so powerful, it can change you in a second. Thank you for this message. Amen. Mm-hmm.